Chapter 77 Atkins closed and locked his door behind him and set off into the cold, wet afternoon. Cara jumped excitedly about his heels. Down, girl, he snapped sharply at her, pulling at her lead. She gave an excited bark but did as she was told and walked next to him obediently. Her ears were pricked up, her mouth open with tongue lapping to one side, her hot breath filled the air with short-lived clouds. Atkins enjoyed his beat, enjoyed having Cara with him to keep him company as he walked it, and despite its problems, he even enjoyed living in Firestone. He knew the streets well, and having lived here all his life, he also knew most of the residents as well. Afternoon, he nodded a welcome to Mrs Grimes, whose husband had, at some time over the past twenty years, repaired the plumbing of every household in town. She nodded a welcome and carried on her way with a basket full of fruit from McColl's Fruit and Veg Shop on the High Street. The McColls had run the shop since his father was a child, and it was now being passed to the third generation of McColl boys. His beat took him away from the main streets in town and around its perimeter, where the trees met the roads and buildings, and the town gave way to cops. Usually, his only concerns along these back roads were the odd fallen tree or an animal hit by a car that might need clearing. Today, he peered into the trees anxiously, searching for any sign of his missing friends. As he walked along the roadside, Kara suddenly gave out a bark, and the hackle stood up on the back of her neck. "'What is it, girl?' he asked, peering into the dark trunks to see what might have caused her alarm. He stared into the trees, hoping to see them appear suddenly. For a brief second, he thought he saw a movement behind a tree buried deep in the darkest region of the copse. It was over in an instant, a brief shifting of light, a bending of shadows. Kara yelped. Her bravado had disappeared, and she began tugging on her lead to get away. "'Hold on, girl, what is it?' he asked, taking a step closer to the trees, crossing the line between road and undergrowth. Kara did not follow. She remained by the road, pulling at her lead, trying to stop him taking another step. Again, Atkins saw the barest of movements, and it seemed, for a second, as though the trees suddenly stopped. The wind ceased, their branches stood still, and from within them came another noise, a different whisper, like a voice shouting so far away that he couldn't catch the words. He dropped the lead releasing Kara, who ran full sprint away. Atkins took another step further into the trees, then another, and another, and slowly he became enveloped by them, and disappeared amongst them. Atkins looked about the trees, searching for the movement again, trying to trace it, but every time he thought he saw it, it had moved a little deeper into the trees. He slowly crept inwards, as if walking out to sea, not wanting to get out of his depth, not wanting to get too far away from the safety of the road. He was distracted for a moment by a memory awakening from the dark recesses of his mind. He suddenly felt as though he had been here before, a long time ago. Then, suddenly, the trees were everywhere, and he found himself surrounded. He glanced back, but the road was gone. Now all was trees. He went to turn and run back where he had come, but found he was paralysed. His legs were rooted to the ground. His body was frozen still. He tried to scream, but no sound came. Then his legs began to move uncommanded, and he lurched forward involuntarily. He began to panic as his body stalked quickly and clumsily through the trees. All he could do was watch, an unwilling spectator. The woods seemed darker than ever. The trunks stood out like ancient pillars, propping up a decayed roof. Space and light flitted around nervously. The trees would suddenly seem two-dimensional, like a picture in front of his eyes, and then bounce out to three dimensions dramatically again when he tried to focus. Shapes oozed through the thick nothingness that was the space about and around him. He was aware of something else with him, off to his left. It walked with him through the trees. It was aware of his presence, but did not bear him any mind. The knowledge of his existence was not helped by his ignorance of whom or what it was. As the two of them marched, another joined them, and another. Atkins strained to see what they were, following him through the trees. He could just see in the very corner of his vision the mayor, still in his pyjamas. He reeled in shock, realising he had found one of the missing men, but was totally powerless to help. He then realised who the others were, and that he too must now be one of the missing men. He looked around as best he could and managed to see Dr Sparrow and Charlie. He couldn't see Banks, though he knew that didn't necessarily mean he wasn't there. He had the distinct feeling that they were looking for someone, but he could not begin to guess where. As they stomped, flailing and stupefied along, things trickled and flashed around the trees, unfathomable shapes beyond the realm of his senses. One of the incomprehensible shapes that haunted the world they had stepped into came forward and approached them. They could not move, nor could they react. The bodies of the men all stopped walking. They were lost now, silent vessels, yielding witnesses to events beyond their understanding. The shapes that approached flitted effortlessly through a myriad of wavelengths before settling upon bright, burning white. They stopped, 
two bright white lights burning amongst the pillar-like trunks. Welcome back, my friends. The voice came from nowhere, yet echoed everywhere. Despite this, the men all knew what was responsible and that it was them being addressed. Thank you, came a chorus of voices in reply, a game from nowhere. The men could not understand where the new voices were coming from. Where is the last? the eyes asked. His vessel rebelled, the voices chimed in reply. Atkins tried to listen for the source of the other voices, but sound travelled in odd directions in the trees. Where is it now? the lights asked. It also came here, the voices informed it. Atkins heard the voice clearly and realised it was his own, and that he and the other men were conversing with the lights. We must find it, the lights told them. The time is upon us. Atkins tried to fathom what they were talking about. Yes, we must take it to the man. He will free the last. He heard his own voice say in tandem with the others. He wondered at what was making him talk. Yes, come, I will take you to the door, the lights told them, and the men found themselves following the eyes as they slipped into the trees. The eyes led them deeper and deeper into the trunks, the space becoming smaller, the light fading. When all was almost dark, when they were hidden deep in the trees, a bright light started to appear ahead. It has begun, the eyes told them. They surrounded the door, which consisted of two huge bright monoliths standing proudly in the dark. Yes, it is the new man. He has opened it again, but it is not ready. The lintel is gone. He will need to find it. We must tell him. Yes, he will find a way, the eyes told them. He sees us. He will free us all, the eyes informed them, as around them shapes of different sizes and consistency emerged from the trees to study the visitors to their limbo world. The men all struggled for escape, but all they could do was stand and allow themselves to be studied as the shapes shifted and oozed around them. Chapter 78 The inspector arrived at the Green Man to find everyone had just about finished eating and were enjoying their drinks. The pub was full to the brim, not just with soldiers and policemen, but also with Firestone residents who had learnt of the daily lunchtime meet and had come along to learn the latest from the site. The entire population of the Green Man seemed to turn and greet him, pleased to see him, as if they had been worried about where he had gotten to. He smiled and nodded to those who said hello as he made his way through. The inspector was pleased to see so many of the townsfolk here, glad to see them taking an interest in what was happening in their hamlet. He was sure that the discovery of the band was going to change the town forever, and the smoky air was charged with excitement. The pub was hot and sticky from all the wet-clothed men, and he noticed behind the bar a bustling Mavis serving drinks. Mavis, he called, any chance of some tea? She nodded to him in reply as she poured a pint with one hand and took money with the other. She handed the drink over and set off at once to get the kettle on, leaving a wide-grinned Lionel to handle the bar. A group of soldiers standing at the bar turned and nodded to him respectfully. Thank you for all your hard work, he enthused to them, though they seemed to need little more thanks than to be treated to an afternoon in the pub. Ah, oh, Inspector! The Major approached with a glass of brandy in hand. You'll have to stop spoiling the men like this. They'll start getting used to it, he laughed. Just my small way of showing my appreciation, the inspector replied, pleased to see his efforts having the desired effect. He made his way through to the dining area and was surprised to find there was still some food remaining. He grabbed a plate and piled it high with sandwiches and crisps, which he began to devour gratefully. He noticed Dr. Sampson and his colleagues sitting in one corner in their muddy clothes and made his way over to them. Hi, oh, inspector, good to see you. Sampson welcomed him as he approached through the sea of activity. And you, what updates can you give me, the inspector asked, through a mouthful of prawn salad sandwich. Well, lots of finds in the soil from the mound, no remains yet. Not sure if that's a good result for you or a bad result. It fits my new hypothesis, he informed them, starting to eat another sandwich as Mavis arrived with his tray of tea. There you are, inspector, she flustered, placing the tray down on the table. Enjoy, she called to him as she rushed off to see to another customer. Thank you, he called after her. He began pouring a cup of tea when Drew approached. Inspector, everything well, I hope, he asked. Their voices were raised over the din of the pub's occupants as soldiers and villagers rubbed shoulders comfortably. Yes, Drew, all well. How goes things here? Yes, the men are just about ready to leave, but I thought I'd better warn you. There's a journalist asking a lot of questions. Wonderful. Local or national? The inspector replied to Drew's surprise. He wasn't used to having media interest in cases, and had always presumed it to be a negative thing. Well, there's a chap from the BBC desperately trying to get someone to talk to him, but no one seems quite sure what they can and can't tell him, so they're all staying quiet. Good to hear. Point me in his direction and I shall field the questions. He finished his sandwich and picked up his mug of tea, then Drew led him over to where the man from the BBC stood trying to casually bribe some information out of a group of soldiers by offering them cigarettes. One of them saw the inspector approaching. He's the bloke you want to talk to, he informed him, accepting the cigarette and lighting it quickly. 
Indeed, I am the bloke you want to talk to, the inspector informed him. Finally, the journalist sighed. John Harper, BBC. What exactly have you found in the woods? he asked immediately. Your cooperation in this would be most welcome, the inspector informed him, ignoring his question. We have discovered a major archaeological site, and we are currently busy clearing it for viewing by the public. Unfortunately, the site is not yet safe for you. However, I have prepared a statement and have some photographs for you. He reached into his ever-present case and removed a brown envelope which he held out to the journalist. The man took hold of it, but the inspector did not let go. The two men stood looking at each other, holding the envelope between them. Journalists will be allowed access to the site once we have finished with it, which should be within the next few days. This will then be a story of national interest, the inspector continued. So I congratulate you on getting here so early. So what have you discovered in the woods, the man asked again, glancing hopefully at the envelope. Is it anything to do with the missing men? The mayor and the sergeant, what's his name, Banks? The journalist smiled, hoping to rile the inspector by showing how much he knew. It is indeed connected to the disappearance of those men, and to the appearance of a body in the woods near here a few days ago, the inspector nodded. His tone had changed. He was suddenly quiet, yet domineering. The case is nearing its conclusion, which is why it is vitally important that I must ask you to not open the envelope until the case is over, the journalist finished for him. He realised suddenly the authority the inspector carried. Indeed, please do not publish this story until the case is finished and I am gone, the inspector asked him commandingly. The journalist had lost his smile. This is a case of top secrecy, do you understand? The journalist swallowed, suddenly feeling a little out of his depth. Yes, sir, he replied, trying to keep up the pretense of confidence. All is explained in here, the inspector finished with a smile, letting go of the envelope. He returned to his usual self, much to the relief of John Harper. Are you going to tell me anything else, he asked. I am not, the inspector told him simply displaying his usual mix of overarching authority and friendliness. Knowing when he was defeated, the journalist nodded, accepting the situation. Well, at least that's better than nothing, he conceded. Thank you, uh, Inspector. You may call me Inspector, the Inspector informed him. Well, thank you, Inspector. He tapped the envelope and made his way through the throngs of people to the door. Drew and the Inspector watched him leave. Do you think he'll be back for more details, Drew asked? Hopefully, the Inspector replied. If he's a good journalist, he will. I bet he's on his way up to the stones now. Drew did little to hide his surprise. You want this open to the public? You want people here? My dear Drew, it is the secretiveness of this town that has caused all this to be hidden in the first place. By opening up to the outside world, we can stop the stones from ever becoming lost again. Drew pondered this for a moment and realised he had a point. I expected a bigger fight from the townspeople, the inspector informed him. All these strangers descending on the place, but they've been nothing but welcoming. They're all tired of being held captive by the cops, Drew replied. Yes, and hiding from the ghouls they have created for themselves that dwelt within it, the inspector added. He was still holding his tea and took another swig. They are welcoming the change because they know, like I did, that your arrival here would mean no more hiding. The secrets of the cops are finally giving themselves up, Drew told him. They stood in contemplation for a moment while the inspector enjoyed his tea. So do you think there are ghouls hiding in the cops, Drew asked. There certainly is something in the trees, the inspector admitted, and tonight I hope we can find out what it might be, he revealed. We? Drew asked, a little reservedly. I will need your help, yes. If you could see your way to meeting me at the Stones tonight at about half past midnight, and we will see what we can see. Of course, I will be there, Drew confirmed with a nod, though he did wonder at the strange hour. Just then they were approached by the Major. Afternoon, gents, he said. Major, the inspector welcomed him with a smile. The men are all ready to head back, so we'll be off in a few moments, he informed them. Excellent, the inspector replied. Drew, I will get a lift up the road with you if that's all right. Of course, Drew agreed. Well, see you up there. The Major nodded and turned to his men. OK, lad, let's move out, he called to them, and the men marched noisily out, halving the population of the Green Man. They left in the wake a much quieter and emptier place. Ready when you are, Inspector, Drew informed him, lowering his voice in the new hush that had covered the bar. Of course. The Inspector finished his tea and they followed the soldiers outside. The bus was already making its way towards the site when they exited out into the cold air. The car's just over here, Drew informed him. But before they could cross, they were met by a fretful and frightened Kara, on her lead but with no Atkins in sight. She made her way directly to the inspector and cowered behind his legs, whimpering and shaking. There, there, Kara, it's all right. The inspector stroked her gently as he spoke. Odd to see her out without Atkins. He's usually so careful with her, Drew remarked, immediately fearing the worst. Well, perhaps we should return her to him, the inspector suggested. He picked up her lead and walked her over to Drew's car. She jumped in without any need for coercion and took up residence on the back seat. The inspector and Drew climbed into the front and within a few minutes they had reached Atkins' small house. The inspector took Kara and knocked on the front door. 
Kara barked and scratched to be let in, and after a few minutes with no reply, the inspector returned with her to the car. Best get in contact with the station. See if Atkins has reported in today, he told Drew. Right you are, Inspector. He picked up the radio and called in. Any news from Atkins today? He asked the constable who was operating the station radio. No, not since lunch. He usually does his beat along the Copse Road about this sort of time, if you're looking for him. We are, and we have Carl here with us. There's no sign of him, Drew informed them. He glanced at the inspector, who had a look of concerned contemplation on his face. I hope Atkins hasn't become our next missing person, he informed Drew calmly. We should go and check, and then drop in on Dr. Sparrow and the others, Drew nodded. We'll drive up the Copse Road where he walks his beat, Drew informed the constable on the radio. Then the inspector and I are going to check on Sparrow. The radio crackled and fizzed. Understood. I'll let them know over at Nettlewood. Over and out, Drew told him. Roger, over and out. The radio fell silent again, and without a word, Drew started the car and drove them towards the back road out of the town. It wasn't too far. Drew slowed as they prowled the outskirts of the trees. Kara hid on her seat, not daring to look out. They drove with the utmost care, keeping watchful eyes on their surroundings. No sign, Drew asked. Nothing, the inspector replied, though he wondered if that's what they should have expected. Let's head over to the surgery. Drew put on his flashing blue lights and sped them back into the town. At their arrival, they leapt out of the car and ran to the surgery to be greeted by a handwritten note taped to the glass inside the door. It read, All appointments cancelled today. Surgery closed. Not what I was hoping for, the inspector said, trying the door but finding it locked. No, this is ominous, Drew agreed. The inspector rapped on the glass and a lady appeared with a scornful face that vanished when she saw Drew's uniform. Mrs Howells, a receptionist, Drew informed the inspector quickly while she unlocked the door. Are you here about Dr Sparrow? she asked nervously. We are, the inspector informed her. I'm an inspector down from Scotland Yard. I presume from your note and your face that he is missing. Yes, I haven't telephoned the police, though. I thought you might be here to give me some awful news, she told them, stifling a worried sob. No, we have no news, but we are looking for him, don't worry, he reassured her with a warm smile. For now, wait here and report to us immediately should you see or hear from him, the inspector asked gently. Of course, she replied, glad to have a purpose of sorts towards Doctor's recovery. We'll need to get back onto the station and let them know, the inspector informed Drew. Drew nodded and then returned to the car, where Drew called in the situation. Go ahead, Drew, over, came Frank's voice. It was full of trepidation. He had come to the radio for updates when the constable had passed him the news. Confirm we now have two more missing persons, Atkins and Sparrow, both now unaccounted for, over. The line went quiet for a moment. Roger that, Drew. We presume the inspector is aware of this, over. Both men could hear the sergeant's concern. Roger, he's with me now, looking for them, Drew replied. We will need to get someone round to Mrs Sparrow's house to get a statement from her, Drew informed Frank. He turned to the inspector suddenly. If that's all right with you, Inspector, he double-checked. Yes, that's top work, Drew, he replied. Could you check if any of the men Sergeant Gates sent to follow the members of the Mayor's party have returned in yet? The Inspector asked, hopefully. Drew nodded. Anyone reported in regarding the other suspects, Sarge? The radio crackled between the gaps in their conversation. Yes, Drew, one's back now. Hold on. There was a break in the conversation while Frank hollered for his colleague to come to the radio. Barnes here, sir, came a new voice when the radio crackled back to life. I've been trying to track you down for the last hour and a half. The inspector took the radio receiver from Drew. I apologise, the inspector informed him. We were at the Green Man. Please tell me what you saw of Atkins. Yes, sir. He walked his beat, then went home for lunch. Nothing strange there, like. Then he went out again and I followed him. Then he takes a turn into the woods and promptly vanished. No trace at all. Weirdest thing I've seen. I did start into the woods to see if I could spot him, but he was gone. The inspector thought momentarily. Whereabouts did he enter the trees, he asked. Down the Copse Road. If you turn left out of Collier's Avenue, he went in down there on the right about 100 feet. Thank you, Constable. The inspector scribbled down the location in his notebook. Please could you track down your colleagues and have them contact Drew with the whereabouts of the men they are following? Yes, sir, can do, came the crackled reply. Thank you. Over and out. The inspector hung up the receiver. Well, Drew, let's head back to the stones quickly, see what progress they have made. Drew had hoped they would be looking for Atkins and the others, and wondered at the importance the inspector was putting on the stones in the trees. Chapter 79 The body of Sergeant Banks fell over clumsily and then stood again, pulling itself laboriously to its feet before continuing to trudge slowly and painfully through the trees. Where? he sobbed weakly. Where? Where? We must find that man. He will be amongst the trees, he replied to himself in a loud, clear voice that was not his own. What remained of Banks's mind watched as his body was carried against its will through the trees. The energy that had inhabited his body had finally overcome him, and he was no longer in control. The voice he imprisoned, that his family had imprisoned for generations, had broken free. 
Banks now could only watch helplessly as the energy that had been trapped within searched the cops for their means of escape. Banks saw the cops flit and skirt about them. It faded in and out like a haze. The pain of possession racked him and tore him apart. He knew not how long he had endured this torture, how much longer he could endure it, nor how much longer there was to endure. He wept and wept, defeated, overcome, hijacked and raped. No, no, why, he cried, trying to scream, hoping to find help, but knowing that ultimately it was useless. The trees stretched on and on, a corridor of trunks without end, without day or night, without conclusion or meaning. Through it tripped the bloody body of Banks, its new possessor grappling to control it after such a long time suffocated under Banks' will. The wood skimmed past them, out of sync, out of time. They wandered through a world between the trunks, on a different angle to the trees. The woods were empty and unceasing, like their search. Chapter 80 During the inspector returned to the mound, where they found the man from the BBC talking to the policeman at the tape. Drew, can you wait in the car for any radio contact regarding the missing men? Come and find me if you hear anything. Drew nodded, rather glad not to be trudging through the rain and sticky mud back to the stones. Of course, Inspector, if you insist, he replied. The inspector opened the door and the rain immediately began trying to blow into the car. The inspector sighed. I will be back as soon as I can, he informed him as the cold bit his cheeks. I just need to get things ready here. He climbed out and closed the door, then opened the back door. I think I have a job for you, Kara. Come on, girl, out you come. Kara jumped out of the car with the inspector, leaving Drew alone with his thoughts and the radio. Afternoon, the inspector called to the journalist, who looked utterly fed up, standing in the rain, failing to get information from two very quiet policemen. The inspector signalled for them to follow him, and they moved back from the line to talk privately. Afternoon, officers, he spoke to them quietly. No trouble, I hope, he nodded surreptitiously toward the journalist. No, inspector, this lad's from the press, he pointed him out to the inspector. BBC, no less. Yes, we met earlier. I trust you told him everything you know, the inspector asked with a smile. Well, that ain't going to be much, the older one joked, and they both shared a laugh. We've only told him some stones have been found and that you're excavating them. Is there more to tell, then? he asked the inspector. The inspector pulled out a brown envelope for them from his case. This is the press pack I gave him earlier. I'm sure by now he has digested the contents. This is everything he knows, so tell him no more than this, the men nodded. Finally, something to do, the older one joked again, removing the sheets and beginning to read. I have something else for you, he informed them, handing the younger one Kara's lead. Some company. Well, hello, Kara, the older man said, recognising her. Where's our Atkins, then? he asked, rather surprised. Missing, the inspector informed him shortly, along with the mayor, the doctor and the sergeant. That is something we will not be informing the man from the BBC, he informed them, though he already knows about the mayor and banks. Right you are, they nodded in understanding, more than a little concerned about the missing men. The inspector gave Kara a playful stroke of the head and then left them to it. Kara looked up at him adoringly, with lively black eyes, and wagged her tail excitedly. He stalked up the path through the trees, his Wellington squelching through the mud. When he reached the stones, he found a widespread operation of clearance, as little by little the mud that had covered the site was gradually removed. "'Oh, no, this will never do,' the inspector muttered to himself. "'Gentlemen, if I can just have your attention for a moment,' he called to the men around the stones. The men stopped what they were doing and turned to listen. It is time we concentrate our efforts on clearing the two standing stones and clearing a path to them through these remaining piles. He indicated the piles he wanted removed with a pointed finger. And clearing the path out to the trees, he informed them, indicating with his arms the course that he wanted the path to take. I need this path cleared before you can all go home tonight, he called to them loudly, his voice echoing eerily between the trees, as if they were too were listening, wanting to know what the next move would be. The men muttered reproachfully to themselves as they judged the amount of work they had to complete that evening. The Major stepped in and cut off their misgivings in an instant. "'You heard the man. Don't just stand there looking pretty. Let's see some movement, shall we?' he yelled at the top of his voice at them. They immediately jumped into action, quickly forming a busy line between the stones and the truck, and shoveling soil toward it and onto the back. It began to fill with earth, and the inspector approached the Major. "'Do you think this amount of work will be an issue for them this evening?' he asked, rather worried it might be too much. We might need to break out the torches in a couple of hours when the sun sets, but we'll be able to get you your path, the Major informed him. He studied him closely for a moment. Can I ask why the sudden need for a clear path to the stones, he asked. Why the hurry to uncover them? They have been hidden for hundreds of years, so why the sudden rush now? The Major, despite himself, was impressed with the inspector, and how he had handled the men over the last few days. 
He was intrigued as to what it was exactly that this man did, and what he had done to wield the power to arrange all that he had so quickly and effortlessly. "'If I'm honest with you, Major,' the inspector said quietly, as if sharing a secret, "'do you promise not to tell?' The Major took a step closer. "'The truth is, I actually have no idea what is going on,' the inspector told him quietly. "'Or what these stones are for, or why they are here, or how they are connected to the body. "'I really don't know or understand any of it.' The Major nodded, his attention captured. "'But I am very good at finding these sorts of things out, and I suppose that is why we have our hurry.' "'I have to find out what it all means before some other poor soul meets his end in the copse,' he informed him. The Major smiled, glad to have had a moment with the inspector he could call his own. "'If you want to know why, the real why, then the answer is that we are here in the interest of public safety. "'We are here for national security, and I suppose that's as good an explanation as I can ask for,' he replied. "'The inspector smiled. "'Inspector!' came a call from the other end of the path. "'The inspector turned to see Drew waving to him from the roadside. "'Must be off!' He patted the Major on the shoulder and rushed off to Drew. The Major saluted him as he disappeared again. What news? he asked as he approached. Drew waited until they were both in the car. The men have all come to the station with similar stories. One of them, looking for Charlie, hadn't seen him all day. When he failed to open up, he went and checked, only to find he had gone. The back door was wide open, so he thinks he might have slipped out through the back of his garden, which leads directly onto the woods, the inspector finished the sentence for him. Well, now I have set things in motion here, we can start to check the points in the copse where the men have vanished. Let's start with Atkins. Of course, Drew replied. He started the car and they set off along the cold, wet road. As Drew drove, the inspector removed one of the instruments from his bag, and upon flicking the power switch, the needle quickly rose to red. As they headed away from the stones, it slowly sank down to green and almost zero. The inspector carefully noted the falls gradient on his map. He watched the needle intently, and as they approached the area where they thought Atkins could have entered the trees, it slowly rose again. Here we go, Drew, this is close enough, the inspector informed his unwitting partner, and Drew pulled up on the side of the muddy road. Before he exited, he flicked a switch and the car's blue lights began spinning, so to one other road users of their presence. They climbed out into the cold afternoon and began stalking along the trees, the inspector flicking between the slowly climbing needle on his instrument and the border between the trees and the road. The needle suddenly jumped up, and the inspector spotted some needles bent back, as if someone had not long entered the trees. There was certainly some activity here recently, he informed Drew, indicating the trace he had found. Oh yes! Drew crouched down closer to get a better look. They both looked into the trees, but there was no sign of any movement. Shall we take a look, the inspector suggested, and began to carefully tread into the trees. Drew followed closely behind, but was not quite as eager. Within a few yards the road was lost, and the trees surrounded them with their eerie presence. The reading is fading the deeper we go, the inspector mentioned, half to himself, as he fished the map out of his case and noted the time and location on it. What's causing it? Drew asked. That I am not sure about, but it would appear that at the time of his disappearance there was a huge surge of electromagnetic activity here. Let's have a quick look around before heading back to the car. You may never know, we might spot him. The two men began walking further into the woods, the inspector checking his instrument every few yards, but otherwise he kept his eyes closely on the ground and the trees about them, in the hope of noticing something that might act as a clue as to Atkins' location. "'Spotted anything?' he asked Drew, hopefully. "'Nothing,' Drew replied. "'As I thought,' he nodded, not looking particularly surprised. "'Well, let us not dwell here. We can head down to the Black Prince and see if the readings are similar.' Drew nodded and they began heading out of the trees, but he realised that he had quickly become disorientated and relied on the inspector to find their way back to the road. When they emerged, he found they had travelled further through the copse than he had thought, and they had to trek back to the car. They were soon back in and on their way, and at arriving at the Black Prince, they found Sam knocking at the door and peering through the glass. I'm afraid he will be shut for a while, the inspector informed him as they approached. Ah, it's you again, Sam replied quietly. He looked as though he had may have already had a few before arriving. "'Where is he, then?' he asked them, with a smile and ruddy cheeks. "'No idea, I'm afraid, but we are looking, and I am hoping to find some clue here. "'Any idea of how we can get into the back garden without clambering over the fence?' the inspector asked. "'Yes, there's a gate round the other side. Here, I'll show you.' "'They followed him round the side of the pub and down an alley between it and the house next door. "'He lent an arm over a high fence at the back, and after a moment of fiddling, "'managed to slide a bolt to one side and let them in. "'Ah, oh, thank you. You have saved me a lot of effort,' the inspector said. "'Oh, no problem,' the man replied, a little forlornly. Drew and the inspector entered the garden, and Sam followed them in, looking through the back door of the pub and not seeming to know what to do with himself next. The inspector offered a friendly smile. "'You know, the green man is still open. They're very welcoming,' he informed him. "'Yes, I suppose,' Sam replied vaguely, and wandered back down the alley distractedly. "'Oh dear, I do hope he'll be all right,' the inspector said as he wandered away. 
Let's see what we can find then, shall we, he suggested, removing his device and beginning to traipse about the small garden. It was full of long grass, but the lawn was patchy and overgrown with weeds. A bench leant against one wall that looked as though it might collapse if anyone were to actually sit on it. The needle on the instrument slowly climbed, but did not make it very far on the scale. The residual energy was beginning to dissipate, the inspector concluded. It would seem that Charlie entered the woods at roughly the same time as the others. He marked his findings on the map, which was by now becoming covered in lines and dates. I don't think we will garner anything else from visiting all the sites of the disappearance, the inspector told Drew. And it's getting too dark to be able to see anything that might have been useful, Drew pointed out. Indeed, the inspector thought for a moment. Shall we head back to the stones for now? I am hoping the concentrated efforts of the men up there will have prepared the ground for tonight, and am eager to see their progress. Of course, Drew replied, glad to be heading out of the untidy garden. On the journey back, the inspector watched his instrument nervously, waiting to see if the needle would crawl up as they approached the stones. When it began moving again, he breathed nervously. The reading was higher than before. He watched it until they parked, satisfied that the energy was still there. On their arrival at the stones, they saw the men were beginning to fill their coach with their tools in the drizzle that had done its best to thwart their efforts all day. They were all worn out through their efforts, moving slowly and carefully through the encroaching dark. Drew and the inspector soon found the major rounding up the last of the men from around the stones. "'Our oh, inspector, I hope this meets your satisfaction,' he asked. The inspector began pacing the path out, getting an idea of its width. He whipped out his torch and flashed it around the cleared ground. "'Yes, this seems fine. Thank you. I appreciate the extra effort this evening. "'Happy to help. See you in the morning.' He waved them goodbye and stalked off to the coach. "'Well, Drew, I think that will do for the day,' the inspector announced. Drew was also clearly feeling the pressure of the long day they had had. "'I was hoping you might join me for dinner,' the inspector asked. "'Well, actually, I had planned on meeting Casey at the Swan and Dove,' Drew replied, then thought for a moment. "'But I'm sure she wouldn't mind if you joined us.' "'That would be most agreeable. I will, of course, telephone her first to ensure she doesn't mind.' That would be appreciated, Drew replied. Shall I pick you up in an hour? I'll need time to go home and change. The inspector checked his watch as they began walking back to the entrance. Yes, that sounds good. See you at the green man about seven. As they approached the path, they heard the coach pull away into the night. Seven it is, the inspector agreed as they ducked under the blue police tape. The dark night and the unrelenting weather had finally forced all the spectators home. Even the journalists had made an escape from it. The two constables were sat in their patrol car at the side of the road, trying to keep warm. The windows were open and both sat fitfully smoking cigarettes. "'Evening, gentlemen,' the inspector called to them as they approached. "'Ah, evening, inspector,' the elder constable greeted him. "'Drew,' he called over his shoulder. "'You're welcome to finish here now. Head off home,' he informed them. "'Are you sure, sir?' the old one asked. "'Yes, of course. It's an awful evening. I'm sure you would rather be at home in the warm.' "'What do you want us to do with Kara here?' the younger asked, nodding to the sleeping dog in the back seat. The inspector frowned, unsure exactly what he could do with her. I could take her for a while, the constable suggested. Kids would love a dog for a bit, until Atkins is found, he added quickly. Of course, that would be most appreciated. Poor Kara, let's hope we can get Atkins back soon for her, shall we? The inspector asked, hopefully. Well, good night, gents. The men nodded, chucking their cigarette butts away into the night and rolling their windows up. The inspector and Drew stood for a moment and watched as they went on their way down the cold, dark road towards their homes. Come on then, inspector, I'll drop you back at the green man, Drew said, and they wandered back to the squad car.